There's interesting things in front of the pulpit this morning. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Mike, for that beautiful prelude. It was, it was good. Welcome. Good morning. It's good to see everyone. And if you're visiting with us today, especially, welcome. We are glad you're here. Just a reminder, there are open the door cards in front of you, if you don't mind filling one of those out. Well, before I come back up to give announcements and prayer, I have the privilege of introducing the family of Benny and Abby Ferraro, who are going to be doing our Advent reading uh, for us this morning and lighting the Advent candle. We're so blessed to have Ben and Abby with us here in Faith Family. They're very active in the Young Adult Program, and right now we're going to let them uh, have this time do that for us. Good morning. All right. You want to say good morning? No. <laughs> All right. I'll try and do this with a two-year-old in my arms. All right. So as we light the second Advent candle this morning, we're reminded of God's prophecy. Listen closely to the prophecy of Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Look, I am sending my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Then the Lord you're seeking will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you look for so eagerly is surely coming, says the Lord of heaven's armies. But who will be able to endure it when he comes? Who will be able to stand and face him when he appears? For he will be like a blazing fire that refines metal or a strong soap that bleaches clothes. He will sit like a refiner of silver, burning away the impurities. He will purify the Levites, refining them like gold and silver, so that they may once again offer acceptable sacrifices to the Lord. All right. Malachi explain, exclaims, when Christ comes, he will clean and purify his own. Christmas is intended to be a transforming event, not a lovely interlude in business as usual. What we do in Advent in preparation for Christmas will be our means of getting ready for a new way of looking at life, a new way of living clean and pure. How then do we prepare to be transformed by the coming of our Lord? By allowing the light of hope to awaken our spirits, by making room for the Lord to write the covenant on our hearts and by living in gratitude for what we receive in the Lord. If we prepare ourselves by renewing our covenant with God, then we will truly be transformed as Christ comes again into our lives. And then we light a second candle to bring light to every darkness and to guide us in the way of peace. All right, pray with me if you will. God of timeless grace, you fill us with joyful expectation. You make us ready for the message that prepares the way, that with uprightness of heart and holy joy, we may eagerly await the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ, who reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Well, good morning. Can you believe it? it is December. December is here. Christmas is fast approaching. Parents, grandparents, kids. 19 days. 19 days. So that's excitement, hopefully, for the kids. Parents, grandparents, it might be a little bit of anxiety, preparation. We need Christmas. And by that, I mean we need Jesus. This world desperately needs Christmas. We need Jesus. We are prepping this time of year in Faith Kids with a new series called Wait for It. Wait for it. 
And we'll be looking at a couple of different people in the Bible that there's times of waiting for our Messiah and Savior. And this one might seem a little odd because it's not typically a Christmas time that we talk about this person, but he is someone that is very important for the calling out before Jesus comes and getting people ready. And that's really what we want to do this time of year is get people ready for the coming of Jesus. So so we first meet this person in a womb. And they are actually already preparing the way while they're in the womb. Elizabeth comes up to Mary, both of them being pregnant. And John already is making movement when the Messiah is near. That says something right there. An unborn child is declaring the Messiah is here. That's something right there. But then later, we come to know John the Baptist a little bit differently. He's a character, if you will. For one, now I tried to find some camel hair. I was, I was willing to wear some camel hair. Very hard to find. But he's wearing camel hair, right? We might say that's a little odd. Just wait, though. There's more. He's not only wearing camel hair, he's got some honey, most likely honeycomb, and he's got not a grasshopper, but they do look a lot like a grasshopper, locusts. He's eating locusts and honey. So he is definitely a character, right? He is an interesting character, but there's something that's really important to know about John the Baptist. The whole time he's preparing the way for a savior, he does not care what anyone else thinks. He is solely there to prepare the way for Jesus' coming, the Messiah's coming. He even says it. He says, I am not worthy to tie this man's sandal straps. It's not, he's basically saying, it's not about me. It is not about me, but it's about the person coming, the Messiah. He will change everything. And then he says, I baptize you with water. He will baptize you with fire. There's a lot we can learn through John the Baptist in just a very short amount of time. Mark, it only talks about, this part of Mark is 1 through 8, verse 1 through 8 of chapter 1. Not a lot, but this whole time he's preparing the way for a Savior. And we can learn a lot because the Savior has come, right? We do know that. But he's coming again. He's coming again. And a lot of times, we might just sit on our hands, even hide, and just wait. We're just waiting. We can't wait for Jesus to come when we should be preparing the way, like John the Baptist, speaking boldly, not caring what others think about us, speaking boldly about the coming of the Savior once again. So are you preparing the way? in your lives, in your families, in your friend groups, in the people you see on the streets, are you preparing the way? Are you ministering to them? We can all do that. John pointed it up. He didn't point at himself, look at me. All he cared about was pointing up to the Messiah. We should be doing that as well, because we all need a Savior. So let's prepare the way for the coming of the Savior. Thank you, Pastor Jared, for that timely reminder. And again, thank you for thank you to Benny and Abby for uh, lighting the candle and reading for us. And I failed to recognize uh, Duke and Eliza. They're two small children. Glad to have them with us as well. Well, as the kids make their way to the children's program, just a few announcements for you this morning. First of all, as you came in, if you came in the front doors, you noticed maybe three. Uh, new, nice benches out there on our new concrete. Anybody see those? Well, let me tell you how we got those. The daycare for each one of those benches had to collect 100 pounds of caps and lids. So that's 300 pounds of caps and lids for those benches. And uh, you may not know what 300 pounds of caps and lids look like, or how heavy they are, but I do, (laughs) and it's a lot. 
So we're grateful to them for doing that. They're beautiful. They look, they look great. So thank you. Also, some things that are upcoming. Yeah. Just a couple quick things to remind you that are coming up in the life of our church. Uh, the first one, next Sunday, is the kids' Christmas program. And there's lots of reasons why you should come and be a part of the kids' Christmas program. Because it's so un- unexpected what kids do. Uh, it's, it's always a fun time. But they've been working very hard, and we want to be a part of that. Good time to invite family and friends. And it says here that Pastor Jonathan will be giving a homily. And I'm not exactly sure what a homily is, but uh, we will find out. I hope it has something to do with song and dance. I'm not sure. He's probably thinking you should know what a homily is. And, uh, and he will gladly explain it to me tomorrow in staff meeting. The following Sunday is our Christmas concert with Brian Arner. If you've never heard Brian Arner, be sure to be here. Also, and a great time to invite maybe a friend or a family member. And, and, and in fact, we are encouraging you to use that Sunday as a time to maybe bring in some people uh, to church to be a part of that, that concert. And, uh, and Pastor Jonathan's going to give a short Christmas message then as well. And then, of course, after being off for one year, um, December 24th is our Christmas Eve candlelight service. Always a wonderful time, a wonderful thing to be a part of, and we encourage that. Well, I believe that's it for announcements. Um, Let's stand this time as we prepare our hearts for worship and song. Dear Heavenly Father, we recognize you this morning, as always, as King. Lord, you were King of creation. You were King of the Jews. Lord, but you also are King of our heart. And Lord, we pray that in this gathering of people that's here this morning, that you find those who humbly bow before you, willing to give you the place in our lives that you deserve as King and as Lord. And we recognize you. We invite your presence in the form of the Holy Spirit into this time and space this morning. May we be open to what you have to share to us, what you might have to challenge us with, but also what you might have to convict us with, Lord. If there's something that we need to make right with you this morning, may this be the time that we open up the recesses of our heart and life to you. May we leave here, Lord, with with clean hearts, ready to go out and be the light that we need to be, that you've called us to be, Lord, in the world and culture around us that so desperately needs you. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for all the good things that, we, that you give to us. Lord, in the way that you have used this church, this body of believers. Lord, to just spread uh, the gospel for you in this community. In Christ's name, we pray. Amen.
may be seated. Isn't it uh, wonderful to sing the songs of Christmas? Jesus Messiah kind of says it all, doesn't it? All the names of Jesus and how meaningful they are to us at this time of the year. This is the time that we think about giving. We trust that you will continue to support the church during this time. We will be taking a benevolence offering again on Christmas Eve, uh, in our Christmas Eve service, and I trust that you will be remembering that and thinking about that as well. Let's pray together. God, you have given your Son to us, Jesus the Messiah, born as a babe in a manger. Lord, in the humblest of circumstances, you came to us. Lord, we are so grateful and so thankful. What a beautiful time of the year this is. We look around us, we see so many things that we enjoy. Lord, we trust that we will also make sure that we reverence the one who came. Lord, help us to show in our lives the way we reverence you so that others might see that it really makes a difference to know the babe in the manger, our Savior, the one who made a difference in our life. So go with us, we pray. Bless our pastor as he speaks to us the word of God today. Bless the choirs they sing. We pray. Amen.
Well, praise the Lord. I want to give just a couple of thoughts regarding just our appreciation for the choir. You know, I know that um, one of the drastic changes in the life of the church, at least in America, has been music. And uh, some of it has been wonderful, and some of it has been a, a real addition. Some of it really has been lousy. Um, that's my own two cents worth. Um, I sure thank the Lord for a choir, and uh, I just still love a choir. And I think there's a timelessness to that because a choir really represents how so many different voices can come together in such a beautiful way and express truth. And every one of us can find a place. Isn't that good? We can find a place giving our voice, lending our voice to the voices of many, and the result is it's even more beautiful. It's even better than what one could do or two could do, the joy of choral arrangement and coming together, different as we are, to bless the Lord and to give Him glory and honor. So I want to thank our choir and Pastor Mike as well, but I just appreciate the time that is given and the willingness on your part to be used of the Lord to minister to ways we just encountered. And I thank the Lord. Yes. We're looking today at Luke chapter 3, the first six verses. And I want, uh, if you would please, to stand with me as we would read from God's Word. Luke, uh, Luke 3, 1 through 6. It already is, is a part of what uh, Pastor Jared has shed, uh, shared with us, but I don't have... Um, you know, I don't have the, the props. I don't have honey, and I don't have locusts, and I, I don't have um, any furry animal. I don't have any camels here. But we'll do our best um, trusting in the Word today. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip was tetrarch of the region of Iturea, and Trachonitis, and Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene in the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. The word of God came to John. That's a powerful phrase. The word of God came to John. The son of Zacharias in the wilderness. And he came into all the district around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make His path straight, every ravine will be filled, and every mountain and hill will be brought low, the crooked will become straight, and the rough roads smooth, and all flesh will see the salvation of God. You may be seated. Taken from Isaiah chapter 40, we are reminded that part of our responsibility in our engagement with the gift of salvation that comes from God to us is to prepare the Lord's way. Prepare the Lord's way. And before we get to some of those details and some of the meaning of the metaphor listed there, I just want to share again some observations that I believe are very important to us. Luke, as it would have been common for him to do, provides us a context and a timeline, and the timeline is not necessarily a specific year. That's not the way that individuals in the first century would have dated their time or the event or the circumstance that was taking place. They wouldn't have thrown out a date. They would have always, though, given us some grounding and given us some, some clear uh, timeline due to who was in power and who might have been the political regional ruler and ultimately the Im empirical uh, or empire leader. We would have had those kinds of associations. It was during this guy's reign. It was, it was during this person's political reign. It was during this individual's time of authority. 
So yes, he is giving us a date. Yes, he is identifying a time frame. But at the same time, I believe Luke is doing more than that. And I believe as he was inspired, I believe he's also giving us a glimpse of where usually people place authority. In fact, there isn't any authority left out. All of the authorities, both political and religious, that would have been significant and would have had an impact during this grand time in history, Luke mentions. I just find that interesting. Not only is he giving us, it was about this time that John the Baptist came, and it was about this time that the way was being prepared for the Lord to come, but he gives us quite a litany of all the individuals who were in authority. He even then goes on, as I said religiously, to say that the guys that were in charge were were these two characters. They were in charge. They're going to be the ones also that are going to be brought into the story, especially during the Passion of Christ. These names will resurface. These individuals who are the supposed authorities will be revisited. They will they will surface. Now, at this point, Luke doesn't give really any kind of character evaluation. He just says these are the individuals who are in charge. Whether the political setting or the religious setting, these are the individuals who were in charge, even Annas and Caiaphas, those who were important as high priest rulers over Judaism. So here they are. Here are their areas of responsibility, and here is even who Caesar is at this time, Tiberius. I'm not going to get into what we know in history and not going to talk about these individuals' lives because Luke doesn't, but I believe it's interesting that on the heels of that, of listing all of these leaders, we have this very important reality. The Word of God came to John. If there is a continental divide, if there is a break in the text that shows us after all the listings of these powers that would be, we have this beautiful, and I don't want you to miss it, this beautiful phrase, the Word of God came to John. So I want, to, I want to remind us for just a moment that while we might look at world powers, we might look at empires that seem to be on the rise and empires that seem to be on the fall, those that are declining, those are, that are ascending, and even our own local rulers, we can so get caught up in who might be assigned to those specific tasks at this time. We might even care about those who are the standouts that seem to be most noticed these days in the sphere of the Christian order, but there is one reality that supersedes them all. You and I need the Word that comes from God. Boy, if there's ever a day, if there is ever a day where in a piercing, penetrating, cut-through-the-junk reality, if there's ever a day for that kind of a revelation and a parting of the nonsense, it's today. I just want to remind us, Jesus has always been, Jesus has always been, and Jesus will always be the Word that comes from God. So I just, there, there's so much that we could say, but I'll just try to be succinct here. That means this. Regardless of what they say, regardless of even what religious leaders might say, especially if it's out of keeping with God, I want us to be reminded of this, that which is central, that which is foundational to you and to me is the Word that comes from God. I want to hear from God. Frankly, I don't I don't care what a lot of leaders say these days. For the most part, who could figure it out anyway? Amen. 
I often wonder, what are these individuals even saying? And do they even know what they are saying? They use words that just make no impact, have no import. They string words together and put them into sentences sometimes. Sometimes. I guess I am kind of longing for someone who just will speak in a coherent sentence. Just some, say something and mean something. Communicate. But even if they do, I don't care what they say. You and I need a word from God. We need God to be heard. We need God to speak, and He has. And we need the world's bedlam to be put to rest because God has spoken. We need a word from God. We need a word from God. And that is just exactly what He has given. So in John's case, a word came from God. The Word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. You know, John's a guy that we would, have, we would likely just disregard. He's a guy that we would probably pay no attention to him. We would wonder if he was all there, especially if he had stuck in his beard some locust legs and, and if his beard was sticky. And, you know, I mean, we'd look at this guy and we'd say, why in the world would we ever pay any attention to him? Right? He doesn't dress appropriately. The guy doesn't, and he just he hangs out in the wilderness, stays close to the Jordan. But he came preaching. He had a word from God. And this is what he said. He came into all the district around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So before we ever get to the fulfillment of what Isaiah the prophet said in Isaiah chapter 40, Understand what was the content and what was the purpose for John's coming. He was preaching a baptism of repentance. A baptism of repentance. I wonder sometimes if we know what repentance means. I've tried to share it every time that we come across it. But what do we know about repentance? What does that word even tell us? It is beyond sorrowfulness. It is beyond the recognition and the sense of guilt. It is beyond a sense of, of ill at ease. It is beyond even spiritual indictment. It is beyond all of that. It is a requirement of us to do something about those very realities. What do we do when God's finger has been put on us and we're convicted and we know we've done wrong and we're indicted and we know it and we know that we're out of sorts with Him, and we know what we've done against Him, and we know that He's grieved with us, and His Spirit is grieved with us. What do we do? Turn. We turn. Rick got there before I did. I think it was Rick. We turn. We turn. No wonder that the Old Testament prophets remind us, turn and live, turn and live. Why should you die in your sins? Turn and live. There is required of us. God will not force us to turn. God will not get us by the back of the neck and force us to turn. He will come to us, speak to us, convict us, bring our litany of wrongs up before our consciousness. He will do that. But when he does that, he then says, now the ball's in your court. Turn. You're headed in one direction. I am here not only to convict you, but you can always be assured of this. If God brings conviction, he also brings the help and the grace with it. He will not just indict you and leave you in misery. He will not just leave you hopeless. He will convict you always with the knowledge, I'm here also to help you correct it. Isn't that good? He's not just a convicting God. He's a convicting God so that there will also be wonderful grace correction. Correction for us and correction for our course and for our direction. Turn. It means to turn 180 degrees. I've heard some people say, I remember pastors saying, it's a 360 degree turn. No, it's not. He doesn't want you just to take a big loop and head right back down the same road. It's 180 degrees. He wants you to turn from going the wrong way, going the right way. Pretty simple. Pretty simple. 
but we have to turn. We have to hold on to the one who by his blood has given us the wherewithal so that we can turn. For those that would say, I can't turn, don't you ever do that to God. And don't you ever hurl that kind of an insult at Jesus. Because he wouldn't convict you to turn if you couldn't turn with his help. So we are called to turn. There's so much involved in the turn. The turn is, and the change of mind includes, not just a change of opinion, but it's a change of intention. Did we get that? To change one's mind, because that's also involved in this, and to turn doesn't mean I just have a different opinion. It means I also have a very new, radically so new, change of intention. I was pleasing myself even though it really didn't ultimately please me. I was headed in the direction that I wanted to head in, but I didn't realize I was even under the power of the enemy himself. I was going in the way that I wanted to go. I was self-centered. Now my intention is to be Christ-centered, and I am not looking to go my own way anymore. I am looking to go His way, and the way that He leads, and the way that He directs, the way my Savior leads me. I have a new affection, not that which would have degraded and would have brought me to destruction, would have degraded me and would have been the ruining, ruining of my own heart and life eternally, but I turn to the one who came because he loved me so much he gave himself for me before I even knew about him. Think about that. Who in the world dies for people who don't know anything about him? But he did. He did. Why wouldn't you turn to Him who loves you so much that He would render His life and give it up for you and for me? That by His sacrifice and by the shedding of His own blood, by the giving of His own life, He becomes the perfect intermediary. He becomes the perfect sacrifice to save our sorry hides. Praise His name. So John came preaching. He had a word from God. He had a word from God. And he came preaching. He wanted, he wanted to declare it. It was the burden of his heart. It was the passion of his soul. So he was out in rough circumstances and in a rough neighborhood. He was out in, in the absence of a lot doing one thing, summoning people that if you want to come after God, I want you to come out here. And I want you to be baptized as a testimony or as a, as a sign that you indeed are repenting of your sins. If you do that, you will find forgiveness. Isn't that wonderful? You know, we, we folks who believe in holiness, we don't bypass, we don't minimize, we don't demean God's saving grace. That is God's wonderful opening up of a new life for us. And we rejoice in that. We rejoice in the fact that when God says through Jesus Christ He will forgive us, He does. He does. And an old life stops. Amen. Isn't that good? An old life ceases. And a new life commences. Amen. Newness. Newness. So John says... I, am, I have a word from God. I'm preaching this baptism of repentance because it will yield the forgiveness of sins. Time always goes quickly, at least for me, probably not for you, but on Sunday morning it goes quickly for me. So let me summarize the use of Isaiah 40. Every time a king was going to travel somewhere, the most direct route was chosen and a prepared route was necessary. After all, the king was coming. The king was coming. I want to remind us that just as Pastor Jared mentioned today, we do live between two advents. He has come. He is coming. He has come. He will return. And because of that, just like he said, we need to be about preparing. 
we need to be about making ready. It's an interesting picture of our readiness. Raise up the low places. Commentators have always looked at that to try to figure out what all might be spoken of there spiritually. Get rid of your low life. That's my, that's my paraphrase. That's as creative as I get, folks. I mean, don't hold on for something else. That's it. Get rid of your low life. Low friends. Low places. We've heard about that, haven't we? There's a country song about that. I'm just letting you know I've heard it. I don't like country music, but I've heard it. Don't sing it. Don't... Don't do it. You'll give yourself away. Get rid of the, the lowness of a sinful life. Also, come down from haughtiness, arrogance, and pride. Lower the high places, raise the low places, and last that which is crooked, you know, that word in the original is the word that for us in English forms the word scoliosis. To make straight that which is crooked or curved is orthos, where we get orthopedic. So make right or make well what is unwell. Straighten and correct what is crooked. That's what God does when we yield to Him. He helps us come down from our own high-mindedness and haughtiness. My mom used to quote to me often, and I, at times I wondered, why in the world does she quote this over and over again? She quoted it over and over again because I needed to hear it. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a nosedive, a fall. Bring the high down, raise the low up. Get rid of unhealth, unwellness, crookedness, and make it straight. So friends, that's ours to do, by the way. Quit asking God to straighten you up. Hello? Quit asking God um, to help you not be proud. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. Quit asking God to help you not go to the low places. Don't go to the low places. There's a responsibility among us to prepare the way. Get ready for the Lord. Prepare the Lord's way. The Lord's way where? Into you and into me. If we want the Lord to come, and we're promised He will, then prepare the way. Prepare the way. Make ready the way. Sometimes, and I don't mean this unkindly, I mean this with love and compassion. Sometimes we keep asking God to do what He says is ours to do. Sometimes we say, well, God, do this in me. God's saying, I enforce your will to do this. You take the step. You exercise the energy I give you. You say yes when you need to say yes, and you say no when you need to say no. Don't put that on me. Don't put the choice on me, God is saying. You prepare the way. So, friends, if we talk about Advent, and I love Advent, when we think of the gracious comings of the Lord, there's one response that you and I should render. I'm so fortunate that He should come to me. I want to prepare the way. I want the way opened. I want to be amenable. I want to be ready. I want to be prepared. I want Him to have access to me without any opposition. No hindrance, no roadblocks, 
no impediment. I want him to have full access to me. That's yours to do and mine to do. Prepare the Lord's way. During this time of year, I would just ask us in particular, these are good times to focus. These are times to give attention. I just want to give this as an urging to you. When you leave this place today and you eventually make your way home, somewhere in either in a note in your Bible or a note on the refrigerator or where you're most likely to look, just write the words, prepare the Lord's way. Will you do that? May, that? may that be a reminder. May that be a catalyst every day. Am I preparing the Lord's way? Gracious Father, we do not lack for a word from God. My goodness, we have a book. We have a book. Perhaps that would be prep number one, is read the book, know the book. Then you've given us the avenue of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for giving us an open way into the Father's presence. Thank you, we can pray. And Lord, may it be the object and the desire of our hearts to prepare, as we're responsible to do, prepare the Lord's way as He wants to come, as He wants to move in, as He wants to have His way, as He so wants to bless us with Himself. May we prepare the way and even make rough spots smooth. May the way be open. May it be clear. And may we be ready. Teach us this, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand and sing, and then in just a moment, we will receive elements from the Lord's table. Let's stand together.
You may be seated. In just a moment, it will be our privilege to serve you at the Lord's table. What a, what a wonderful time it always is on the first Sunday of the month to share together our common faith so simply but profoundly expressed. So we're always thankful for these moments. We're going to pray and ask God's blessing upon these elements, and then I'm going to ask those who assist us to please take their places, and we will prepare to minister to you. Before we do that, I do want to ask you, as soon as we are done with communion, I have some very, very important prayer requests to share with you, and I mentioned this in Sunday school class. If I ever give an amen, before before I'm able to take a breath, I often see the backs of your heads as you are exiting the sanctuary. So if you would just pause a moment after communion, I want to share with you some very, very important prayer requests and some dates and means of expressing your support that you will be able to share, especially tomorrow and Tuesday. So give me that time, if you would please, before we leave too quickly. I also mentioned in class that we have way too many exits in this sanctuary. You can get away way too quickly. So just remain with me just a moment, if you will, following our time of communion together. Father, we come at this time thanking you for ever sending Jesus to us. He came to this world. We do not doubt that in the least. We, by faith, are products of that very truth. Thank you, Jesus, as the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you that you came. Thank you that you never moved away from the purpose for which you came. We owe you everything. Our devotion should be directed exclusively toward you. We declare today we love you, but we don't love you because we first pursued you. We love you because you loved us. You loved us first, and while we were yet sinners, you died for us. May the name of the Lord be praised. May the people praise His name. Sanctify these elements. May they become means of grace for each of us as we receive them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If those who serve would please come forward, we will receive the elements and take our places and prepare to serve you. We welcome you to come forward if you are able. If you prefer to receive the elements where you are, we will serve you gladly where you are. Make sure you get our attention so that we may do so. But we welcome you to come to the table and receive the cup and the bread. You may come.
Thank you for remaining. Let me share with you some important information as we love one another, minister, for, minister to one another, and pray one for another. Uh, we've had individuals who have suffered loss this week, and we want to mention not only who those folks are, but we also want to remind you to pray and support and be present where you can be. Les Lockhart succumbed to pneumonia and passed away uh, this week, and his wife Kathy obviously is mourning him, and Jean and Miriam Mason, others of his family are mourning his loss as well. The funeral will be tomorrow at 1 p.m. at Sheridan Funeral Home, and there will be calling hours 11 to 1 preceding the service. And then many of you may not have known Bob, but Max and Mary Thomas for quite some time began bringing Bob Hickman to be a part of our fellowship. And I just so appreciated Bob, not only in worship service, but in Wednesday night Bible study. And just a, a dear soul, but a quiet soul. And uh, so appreciated faith and appreciated you and this body of Christ. And uh, unexpectedly, Bob passed away this week as well. And his arrangements are for calling 5 to 8 tomorrow evening at um, Frankie Smith Funeral Home with the funeral Tuesday morning at 10.30 a.m. His daughter, Georgia, has been here with us, and she's very much involved in the Creation Museum and all of that down in the Cincinnati area. And she's a wonderful Christian. So I want us, though, to support to support the family and to encourage them. You may not have known Bob, but he loved us and he was a part of us. And I'm so thankful God ever brought him across our path. So we want to support the family. I would, I would just encourage you to do that in the calling hours or in the funeral services that are planned. If you have any question about that, we can make that known to you. We're also praying for Chester and Polly Boggs in that um, they lost a grandson in Andrew and who, who succumbed to COVID. And then we also got word this morning from Tess Akers that a brother of hers, 94 years old, um, succumbed to COVID and passed away. So we just have had a number of needs emerge when we did not expect them. We also have folks who are quarantining and following protocols this week that we want to remember in prayer as well. So you're good people. You're good people of prayer. And I know you love one another. And we love our brothers and sisters in Christ. So there are losses that are keen and sharp that we're aware of today. And God has blessed us by weaving these people into our lives and making us one. And when we, when we lose one, we sorrow, but not hopelessly. Right? But there's sorrow nonetheless. So we want to be mindful of these who, are, who have lost a loved one and then be supportive where we can be. So if you'd stand, please. We'll conclude our time together in prayer, remembering uh, these folks and praying for them. Father, we thank You that we can put our trust in You. And when life in its fullness and when life in its full scope comes into our lives and when we lose a loved one, we know that if they've put their faith in Jesus, uh, we, we know that there's a temporary loss for us, and it's keen, it's sharp, but we have a hope and an assurance that underneath the loss is our firm foundation. So we thank You, Lord, that uh, we, we have confidence today that Les loved you. We have confidence that Bob loved you. And we pray now your ministry to these grieving family members. We pray, Lord, for um, Andrew's mother, Diane. We pray for Chester and Polly that your comfort will be full and sufficient. We pray, Lord, as well for Tess, now that she's not only gone through the loss of another son, 
but that she's also lost a brother. So we just pray, Father, for those who are grieving today, and there are many others in our congregation who have recently lost a loved one, and this is the first Thanksgiving, the first Christmas, the first New Year, all of these firsts. We pray for your soothing presence, your encouraging help, and your great comfort. We ask as well that you would send us into a world that doesn't have hope yet because they don't trust Jesus. May we be living, breathing hope for our hopeless world. We've seen scenes this week of great trouble, terrible, terrible expressions of the despair that abounds without Jesus. Send us, send us. Help us be responsible. Help us to prepare the way, not just for the king, but also for others to be readied for him. So send us, we ask, with your grace and your help. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Go in his grace. You are dismissed.